Incessantly from a low grey sky, the road was of violent description. There were sections consisting of sharp flints, newly laid down the yet not yet rolled into an amethysty, and the stretches in, the, in between were worn into deep ruts and bouncing holes, so it was impossible anywhere to travel at even a moderate speed. Twice we had punctured, and now, as of stormy dust began to fall, something went wrong with the engine. I was crawling on for a hundred yards or so. We stopped. My driver, after a short investigation, told me there was half an hour's tinkering to be done. And after that, we might, with luck, trot along in a leisurely manner. I hope we eventually to arrive at Crowforth which was the proposed destination. We had come when this touch occurred to a crossroad. Through the driving rain, I could see them on the right a great church in the front a huddle of houses. Constitution of, of the map seemed to indicate that this was the village of Ratterdon. The guidebook added information that Ratterdon possessed a a hotel. And a, a signpost at the corner in Dalston, both to the right along the main road into which we had to just struck was Crowforth, 40, 15 miles away and straight in front of us, half a mile distant, was the hotel. The decision was not difficult. There was no reason why I should get to Crawford tonight instead of tomorrow for the friend whom I was to meet. There would not arrive until next afternoon. It is surely better to limp half a mile with a spiraled romantic engine than ten fifteen on this inclement evening. We're spending the night here, I said to my chauffeur. The road dips downhill. It's only half a mile to the hotel. I don't say we shall get there without using the engine at all. Let's try it anyhow. We hooted and crossed the main road and began to slide very slowly down a narrow street. It was impossible to see how much, see much. On either side there was a little houses of light gleaming through blinds. Oh, the blinds still were dro- overdrawn. It was in cosy interiors. Then the climb grew steeper and close in front of us I saw a mass against a sheet of water that appeared to stretch unbroken into a very soaked loom. Of a gathering light. Richardson, there must be on the open sea. Though how it came about that the boats should be tied up in the open key wall was a puzzle. Perhaps that was some jetty, invisible in the darkness, which protected them. I heard a chauffeur switch on his engine. As we made a sharp turn to the left, we passed below a long row of lighted windows. Shining out of a rather narrow road, on the right edge of which was the water latch. After he turned sharply to the left, described a, a half circle with a crunching gravel. I drew up to the door of the hotel. There was a room for me. There was a carriage. There was a room for him. And dinner had not long begun. Among the little excitements and surprises of travel, there is none more delightful than that of waking in a new place in which one has arrived after nightfall on the previous evening, and the mind was received. A few hints of dusky impressions that probably drew sleep and juggled with ease, constructing them in some sort of coherent whole. Next morning, its interpretations are put to the proof. Usually, I see more than is has consciously registered, brain is fitted together in a manner of jigsaw puzzle, a fair, fair presentment of its immediate surroundings. Well, I woke next morning to 
a brilliant, the sunny sky. It looked in at my windows. The low sound of wind or the breaking waves, before getting up and verifying my impressions the night before, I lay and watched him, my imagined picture. In front of my window, there would be a narrow road, roadway, bordered by a key wall. There would be breakwater, foaming uh, for the dog, goats that lay at anchor there, away, away at the horizon. The horizon was stretched their pants of steel and glittering sea. I ran over there, these points in my mind. They seemed an in- inevitable in- in- interference from glimpses of the night before then, asserted of my correctness. I got out of my bed and went to the window. I've never experienced so complete a surprise. There's no harbour, there's no breakwater, there was no sea. A very narrow channel, three quarters choked the sandbanks on which now rested the boats whose mast, the scene of the previous evening, went parallel to the road. It turned at right angles and went off into the distance. I was no water of any sort was visible. Right and left in front stretched a limitless, limitless burst beds of shining grasses and tufts of shrubby growth, and great patches of purple sea lavender. Beyond was tawny sandbanks, a further yet a line of shingles from the sand dunes, a sea which I had expected to fill the whole circle of the visible world to emit the sky and horizon, had totally disappeared. After the first surprise at the colossal conjuring trick was over, I dressed quickly in order for certain the local authorities how it was done. There's some hallucination that poisoned my perspective facilities. There must be an explanation. This total disappearance eternally of sea and land, the key where it's applied, was simple enough. A line of shingle and shrub and sand dunes horizon was a peninsula running for four or five miles parallel to the, with the land. Forming the true beach, it closed its vast basin of sandbanks and mudbanks and level land of the close covered marsh, which had submerged a high tide, made an estuary. A low tide, it was altogether empty, for, but for the stream that struggled out through various channels to the mouth of it two miles away to the left there was no there was need to across it for a man who carried his shoes and stockings to the far side dunes and beaches which terminated at Wingleton Point where uh, while at high tide you could sail out for the quay just in front of the hotel and be landed there the tide would be out of the estuary for five or six hours yet. I could spend the morning on the beach or taking my lunch, walk out to the point and be back before the early orders rendered the channel impossible. There was a good bathing on the beach. There was a colony of terns who nested there. Already as I ate my breakfast at the table, in the window overlooking the marsh to spell, the attraction of it began to work. It was so immense and so empty, it allured the desert about it, with none of the deserts intolerable monitored me, for companies of chiseling growls hovered over it. I could hear the pipe of ramsack shank, a bubble Kofu lose. I had two to meet Jack Granger in Crowful that evening. I and if I went, I knew I should persuade him to come back to Redditon. From my knowledge of him, I was aware he should, would like to feel the spell of, of the place, not less potent than I. So, having a certain there was a room for him here, I wrote a note saying I had found my surprising place in the world. I told my chauffeur to take the car into Cloughful to meet the train that afternoon and bring him back here. Bring him here. With a perfectly clear conscience, I should set off the town a packet of lunch in my pocket to explore vaguely and goldlessly that beckoning immensity of the lavender covered blue haunted expanse. 
And my, my way, as I pointed out to me, led, first of all, to a sea bank which defended the drained passage land on the right of it with high sea tides. A corner I struck into the basin, the extra tree, contour line of jetsam, vivid grass stones of seaweed, and bleached shells of little crabs showed where the last tide had reached its height, and inside of it the grass grew was still wet. There was a stretch of mud and pebbles and presently, as wading through the stream that flowed down to the sea. Beyond that were banks of ribbed sand, swept from my by the incoming tides, and so it rained the wide green marshes on the further side, beyond which was a bar single that fringed the sea. I paused as I reassured myself. There's not a sign of any living human being within sight, but never have I found myself so in so exhilarating a solitude, right and left of spread the lawns of sea lavender, stared the pink troughs of thrift and thickets of slumbery bushes. Here and there the pools left the depressions of of the ground by the retreated tide, their patches of smooth black mud out of which grew little uh, spikes of milky green asparagus, a crop of grass wort, and all these happy vegetables flourished in the sunshine of rain, the salt of the flooding tides, the impartial Fibonisius. Overhead was the immense arc of sea, across which flew now a flight of duck, harrowing with nets outstretched. And now a lonely black backed gull flapping his ponchous way seawards. Canoes were bubbling and ransacked and ringed of plumber fluting. And now, as I trudged up to the single bank, at the bottom which the marsh came to an end, the sea blew waveless. They stretched the sleeping boarded by a strip of sand, a witch far off a mirage of it. But from end to end of it, as far as I could see, there's no sign of human presence. I bathed and basked on the hot beach, walked along for a mile and a half, and struck back across the shingle into the marsh, and with a pang of disappointment, I saw the first evidence of intrusion, a man into his paradise of solitude, on the stony spit of the ground, that ran like some great rib into the bivious meadows. There stood a squirrel, square house built of brick, with a tall flagstaff set up in front of it. I had not caught it had not caught my eye before. It seemed an unwarrantably evasion of the empty emptiness. Perhaps it was not so gross as an infringement of it, of it as it appeared as it, as it appeared. It wore an inevitable look of desertion. As if a man attempted to domesticate himself, he had failed. As approached at his pressure increased, for the chimney was smokeless, the closed windows were dim with a film of salt air, a fresh of the closed door was packed with inches, shown strewn with debris and weather grasses. I walked twice around, decided it was certainly inhabited. Finally leaned against the sun baked wall at my lunch. The glitter and the heat of the day were at their height and warmed in its exercise. Invigorated by my bathe, I felt stung to the supreme pitch of physical well-being. My mind quite vac vacant, except for the fictitious impressions, followed by the example of my body, a dance in unclouded content. I suppose by a sense of literary and naturally a contrast again the picture itself. In order to culminate these blissful conditions, what this sunlight solitude would be like when some November night could again be closing underneath a low grey sky. A driving storm would sleep, the sunrise would be turned into an abominable desolation. 
If for some unconventional cause one was forced to spend the night here, how the mind would long for any companionship. How sinister would come the calling of the birds. How weird the whistle the wind round the cabin of this abandoned habitation. Or would it be just the other way round? Way, 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 way about. Would be one really be longing to be served? A seeming solitude was real, no invisible but encroaching presence, soon being made manifest, was creeping nearer under the cover of the dusk, be struggling to think that the wall, well, the wind, was not only the wind, the cry of some dis- discarnate being, if not the curfews, who made that melancholy piping. By degrees the edge of thought grew blunt, and melted in caresses and imaginings, and I fell asleep. I woke with a start from the trouble of a dream, a fade from with waking. I felt sure that some noise close at hand had aroused me. When I came again, it was a footfall of someone moving about inside the deserted, deserted house, against the wall which my back was propped. Up and down it went, and then paused and banged again and again. It was like that of a man who waited with a punctuance for some expected arrival. I noticed that also the football had a regular beat, as if the walker went with a limp. In a minute or two, the sound ceased altogether. I know a nearness came over me, for I had been so certain the house was uninhabited that turning my head I noticed that in the wall just above me was a window. A notion, wholly irrational and unfounded, entered my mind that the man inside who trembled was watching me from it. When once the idea got hold of me, it became impossible to sit there in peace any more. I got up and shoveled into my red sack. My tail remains of my meal. I walked a little further down the spit of the land, which ran into the marsh and turned. Then looked at the house again. Again, to my eyes, it seemed absolutely deserted. But after all, it was no concern of mine. I proceeded to my own walk, the town inquire closely on my return to the hotel, who it was that lived in so heretical a place. For at present dismissed the matter from my mind. It has some three hours later that I found that myself opposite the house again of a long walk and walk. I saw that by making an only slightly longer detour. I could pass close to the house again. I knew that the sound of those footsteps within it had raised me, a curiosity I wanted to satisfy. And then as I paused, I saw that the man was standing by the door. How he came there, I had no idea. For the moment before, he had not been there. He must have come out of the house. He was looking down the path and then through the marsh, shielding his eyes against the sun. Presently, he looked, took a step or two forward and he dragged his left leg. He walked limply, limply, heavily. It was his step then when I, I first heard of him. And in the mystery about the matter was no ill making. I therefore took the children path. I got back to the hotel to find Jack Granger had just arrived. He went about in the gleam of the sunset and watched the tide sweeping and pouring up the dikes up again. The great country trick had been was accomplished. A stretch of marshes, fields of sea lavender, was a sheet of shining water. Far across it stood the house by which I had lunched, and just as we turned, Jack pointed to it. That was a queer place for a house, he said. I suppose no one lives there. Yes, a lame man, said I. I saw him today. I'm going to ask the hotel porter who he is. The result of the inquiry was unexpected. No, the house has been inhabited several years, he said. It used to be a watch house from which the coast guards signaled if there was a ship in distress. A lifeboat went there, out there, but now the lifeboat and the coast guards are at the end of the point. But who is a lame man? I saw a walking there. I heard him inside the house. I asked. He looked at me. I thought clearly. I don't know who that could be, he said. There's no lame man about here, to my knowledge. 
The fact that the track of the marshes and as glorious as this is before, the theory was precisely what he anticipated. He allowed it at any day he spent anywhere and now on those beaches and fields to see them. But the day he was in proposed, the tour on which the main object was originally being in conflict in Norfolk. Should it be for present he cancelled, in particular, he was exposed to this long sort of headland that had troubled him. After all, we could play a golf anyway, he said. It's not always the catch of the going. Do you hear? How silly to wipe the head and wipe the ball. Will you pull it? Oh, but that's what I'm just saying. What's the point as well? We spend a day with this. Oh, I don't know what's going on, baby, yes. And we want to run you along the edge of the marsh. Oh, there's a couple of turns down this. They make a noise like a drawing of a cork. They will, there they are, and those little traps are just like colored patches. Let's go on and on the near edge. A march, and come out by the house. Where are your name names? We took that for the path of the long detail, which I had done last night. I had said nothing to him. I went to the park and to the charter to tell me the house was unlived in. All he knew was I had seen my man, a pattern of occupation man. My reason for not doing so, to make the confession at once, was I already half believed that steps I heard inside, and no man I had seen much now so, who did not imply in their quarter sense of words the house was occupied. I went to see that the judge, as well as myself, would be conscious of any tokens a presence there. Then all this thing happened. All the way up into the house, the attention to note on the doors, especially on the piping note, which is unfamiliar to them. They're very trying to catch sight of the door in the attic, and very well trying to hear it. Doesn't sound any of the door I know of the inside. In fact, this is like a bird at all, and like some human being whistling. There it is again. It's impossible you don't hear it. They are now quite close to the house. There must be someone there who is listening, he said. It must be your own boy and man, my lord. Yes, he comes from inside the house. So that's the place it's made. Oh, you're so mean, boy. Oh, why can't you hear it? Some people can't hear this. Let's see, said I. Said I. Don't say to me with explanation. Tell them one more interest. No more interest in the matter. We strike the question of the way we were loaded. I travelled with tumbled sand dunes. I reached the point ended. For a couple of hours we strolled in the lazy ground. The liquid and sunny air. We had to return an oil and cross. And fall before the tide came in. As we were attracted our way, I saw coming out from the west a huge quantity of cloud. Just through the slip of the lands, a witch cast stood, a dreaded universal lightning flapped down to those short lying hills, when you crush your tree and a few big raindrops popped on your shingle. We are for drenching, he said. Ah, those hearts were sheltered, and your lame man's house, but no one for it. Ready to be dropped for fully victory. We scuttled across a hundred yards that lay between us and the house. Came to door, just as a solicitor's, the heaven by wire and pulled a light. He went on it, but there was no one came to answer. He tried to handle it, but the door did not yield. And then, by sudden inspiration, he fell along the top of the linen floor. I found a key that fitted in the walls, and the next moment we stood within. We found ourselves a slip of the passage, and in the which went up to the staircase and floor above. On each side of it was a room, one kitchen and another was a living room, but neither was there any state of furniture. Discovered cables peeling off the walls, the windows were thick with spider web rooms. There, everything was uneventfully damp. Oh, you know, old man, dispenses with necessities, as well as the luxuries of life, said Jack. And Spartan for them, and staying in the kitchen, outside the kitchen train. Well, I had grown into a door and glared the window, but suddenly lit it up with a flare of lightning. A crack of thunder answered it. In the silence it followed, a came from just outside, all oh, now to me, the sound of piping whistle. Immediately afterwards, I found the door by which we just entered, finally banged, and I didn't I remember that I had left it open. My eyes, his eyes met mine.
But there's no breath of wind, I said, that made it bang like that. There was no bird that whistled, said he. That was a shuffle, there was a shuffle, especially outside of him, of a limping step. I could hear them drag a man's late foot across the boards. He has come in, said Jack. Yes, he's come in. And who had come in? A moment not fright but fear, which is very different matter. Clothes on in on me. Fright, I don't say it. It's motion, stereotyping, but not unnerving. But only under the finger of fright, sprung. A sign, you may scream, you may shout, you may have a command of your muscles. But at the limping step moved down the passage of top fear, a head of nightmare that, as it touches, paralyzes, inhibits, not action only. But so I waited frozen and speechless of what would have, should happen next. Exactly opposite the open door of the kitchen, on which we stood the step stopped. And then soundly and inevitably, a presence that made itself famous face to the outward ear entered. Suddenly I heard Jack's breath rattle his throat. Oh my god, he cried in a voice, a voice hoarse and strange. He threw his left arm across his face as he was defending himself. His right arm, shooting out, seemed hit with something which he could not see. His fingers crooked themselves, so clutching as that which was evaded his blow. His body was bent back and just resisting some little pressure, and then forward again. I heard the noise of resistance. Resisting joint, a soil on his throat was shadowed, or oh, it so it seemed, with a clutching hand. I watched that some power of movement came back to me. I remember hurling myself in the empty space between him and me. I felt that under my grip was shaped as the shoulder. I heard the swords and floor, the slip and scoop of the foot, so invisible, no shoulder, no arm. In my grass, I heard a panting with desperation, as not Jack's nor mine. Now and then, in my place, I felt a hot breath of the scent of corporation and decay. All I did was at the time, the physical contentment was suddenly attacked by me. That was not a message with what not a single afresh blood, but some awful spiritual presence. And then... There's nothing. I don't see how you can cease. I saw the little girl. There was Jack's face gleaming with smoke. Face to mind, as we stood in the toilet at arms, opposite each other in the empty room. A rain beating on the roof. I got us chuckling. A rain passed between us. The next moment, we were out in pelting rain, running into the fall. We don't need to speak to my soul. I see the most of rain out of horror. The great darkness, the only corruption, which we had been promised. Now I have no certain explanation again. This means, which was here, is surely recounted. I read a man and may not cover it next. This story I heard a week or two later on my return to London. A friend of mine had dined at my house one evening, and we had discussed the murder film then going on, on which the paper would follow. It's not only the artistic attracts, he said, I think it's a place where the murder occurs. The cause of interest in it, a murder of Rosen and Margate and Ramsey, and a place which public associates have had the trip. Um, because they know the voice, the kid visualizes the scene, and when there is a murder of some small one known spot, they never heard of, they never appeal of their imagination. I explained, for instance, there was a murder, a little city, a small village on the coast of Norfolk. I forgot to know the name of the place. That was all I was annoyed at the time of the trial, with the president in the court. It's one of the most awful stories I've ever heard. The ghastly sensation is it that it lasts a fair, it didn't attract the smallest attention. Oh, I recommend the name of the place, when all the rest of it is so vivid to me. I can't remember the name of the place, but all the rest is vivid to me. Tell me about it, I said. I never heard of it. Well, there was this, uh, 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 this, uh,
I can't think how I forgot it. How I forgot it. 